Hi, everyone. This is Clay Nessler, the Interim President of the Alliance to Save Energy and Vice President of Global Sustainability and Regulatory Affairs for Johnson Controls. Welcome to our first webinar in our EE Global um, Forum series of webinars throughout the rest of the year. I am uh, delighted to introduce our esteemed panel of respondents today. Jeff Eckel, who's president, CEO, and chairman of Han and Armstrong. Joyce Henry, director general, the Office of Energy Efficiency at Natural Resources Canada. Pip Ping, the industry program director for energy efficiency at Energy Foundation China. And Monica Frizzoni the president of the European Alliance to Save Energy. Today's Hello. webinar is focused on the global release of the Energy Efficiency Indicator uh, Study, Lessons for Economic Recovery. The uh, Energy Efficiency Indicator is in its 13th year. It has um, um, been a global survey for over 11 years and surveys um, facility management, energy, and sustainability directors in commercial buildings, institutional buildings, and industrial organizations around the world. We are delighted to be able to share the results of this study with this esteemed panel today. Without further ado, I will be um, uh, going through highlights of the results. And the good news is the technology is working. So the 2019 uh, survey surveyed 1,300 organizations, facility and energy management executives from those organizations in 10 countries, including Brazil, China, France, Germany, India, Japan, Mexico, the UK and Ireland, United Arab Emirates, and the United States. As you can see, the uh, breakdown is, is relatively balanced between commercial buildings, institutional, industrial, and others. Very senior folks were interviewed for this study. Um, many C-level, vice president, director level, and managers. It is an anonymous study. They do not know who is surveying them, and it was, an and it was administered by Navigant Research, our partner for many years. The good news, oh, by the way, the most important piece of information is the survey was completed in November and December of 2019. We are just presenting the results now. And as, as you can imagine, a little thing happened between November, December 2019 and current times. So we're gonna be focusing a lot of our remarks and discussion about what the potential impact of COVID-19 pandemic is on investment in energy efficiency, renewable energy, and other technologies. Back in December, the prospect for investment was great, about the highest it's ever been, with um, the US, for instance, 75% of organizations saying they would invest more than they did the previous year in energy efficiency. The highest was in Germany, very high in France, um, Mexico and Brazil, um, still very high with over two thirds investing um, and a little bit lower in India and the UAE. What are the key drivers of efficiency? Investment, this is our favorite question. We've been asking it for 13 years. Uh, globally, last year, it was um, energy cost savings. 79% said that they were um, um, planning to invest uh, or, or that it was a very or extremely important driver in investment. Greenhouse gas footprint reduction was the second highest operational efficiency, life safety security, and then energy security following up. We call this the Maria Vargas question. Maria, many of you may know, is the uh, head of marketing uh, for DOE, the Better Buildings Program. And um, this is her favorite result in the study. Um, 
one of the important correlations we see is among organizations with goals, either public or internal, for either energy or carbon reduction, the percentage planning to increase investment is much higher. In fact, it's over a factor of two. Organizations with no goals, a third of them will increase. Those with public or internal goals increase, uh, invest at a much higher rate. Let's talk about some of the key themes we see in the 2019 data. Um, we've been tracking resilience for about the last five or six years. It really wasn't top of mind 13 years ago, but it's certainly increasingly top of mind, particularly with natural disasters and um, uh, weather, wildfires, uh, you name it. Um, there's much more need for our built environment to be resilient very significant increase in 10% of organizations that think resilience is very or extremely important in making investments in energy and building infrastructure. Similar, we've been tracking green building certification for 13 years, and um, these are the highest results we've seen. 19% of all organizations have already achieved a certified green building, whether that be LEED, whether it be 3M, Green Star, Green Mark, CASBY, you name it, um, a, some form of green building certification. And another 57% plan to achieve that um, over the next few years. That's up from 44% in 2018. That's the largest single yearly increase we've seen. Of course, that's the supply of green buildings. The demand for green buildings is whether people are willing to pay a premium for space in a green building. And that's at 53%. Over half of organizations are willing to pay a premium for their employees or their businesses to operate in a green building. Net zero is also a trend we've been looking at over the past five or so years, and it is increasing at roughly double the pace we saw in green buildings. 53% of organizations say it's very or extremely likely that they'll have one or more net zero, near zero, or energy positive uh, energy or carbon buildings in the next 10 years. That's up 13% from the previous year. Another 55% say it's extremely likely that they'll have one or more facilities that can operate off the grid in the next 10 years. That speaks to resilience, and that speaks to an interest in energy security. So what are organizations investing in? Every year we give them a list of about 30 improvement measures and they, they tell us one, whether they've invested in that improvement measure uh, over the past year or whether they plan to invest on, in it in the coming year. The number one um, improvement for two years running is actually building control improvements with 70% having made an investment Another is very different. It's about education and behavior, operational changes that building operators and occupants can make in their organizations. HVAC is at the top. You see a couple integration-related themes. That's very new. The idea of smart buildings and integrating various building systems and technologies is a trend we've seen start from near zero over the survey period to uh, ranking in the top 10. On-site renewable energy at 57%, obviously that has increased significantly as, as well as um, the general area of systems integration. Let's do a double click on systems integration. Um, this is a chart that says how many people plan to invest in the various types of integration over the next 12 months. Integration of their building management system with other systems, the integration of security systems, the integration, uh, integration with distributed energy resources, whether that be a CHP facility, whether that be solar PV, whether that be energy storage, EV charging. Um, a third of organizations plan to connect their building with those distributed resources. Lighting, smart building equipment, and then finally with the utility grid. Um, this is one of those improvements that's seen the greatest increase from year to year. So really uh, using your building as an ability to provide services to the grid, benefit from services like demand response, and react to real-time pricing. One of the things that, that 
I think is common knowledge, which perhaps may not be true. Um, we have started surveying recently about the percentage of organizations that have upgraded their control systems, replaced HVAC equipment um, um, before end of life. There's, there's a general feeling that um, the typical operational mode for most organizations around the world is that run things until they break or they're hop hopelessly obsolete. We see um, over a third of organizations updating um, their, their controls and HVAC equipment before it fails to more efficient, more environmentally friendly equipment. Also an interesting um, stat that, that we're, we're just tracking now is, is about a third of organizations replaced a fossil fuel fired heating component, whether that be uh, space heating like a heat pump within their home or their commercial building or their institution or water heating with electric heat pump technology. Clearly interest in decarbonization is driving electrification of heating it's on a global basis. And um, this is one of the surprising results in, in the study that a third of our organizations are already taking action that way. So let's talk about the money. Now we know what people wanted to invest in. One question we've asked for 13 years is what are the key barriers? And this has changed over time. 13 years ago, by far the greatest barrier was a lack of technical expertise to evaluate opportunities and ex execute projects, um, particularly um, around the, the, the developing economies. Knowledge and education were a key barrier. Today, 13 years later, it's, it's much more aligned around funding. One of the big changes between 2018 and 2019 is in fact that um, technical expertise and lack of funding to pay for the improvements has essentially switched. Lack of funding to pay for improvements is now the single greatest barrier to investment. So how are people investing in energy efficiency? Here you see um, the common funding mechanisms for improvement and a comparison between 2019 in blue and 2018 in green. You see most organizations use their internal budget, whether that be their capital budget, or their operating budget. You generally need a capital budget to make major improvements, but operating budget can be done to make improvements through retro commissioning or operational or other changes. You see a little bit of a switch here in that uh, capital budget becomes more important in 2019. Government utility incentives are, are um, increasing in 2019, becoming a more important uh, factor in this. Again, remember this was before the COVID-19 pandemic became worldwide um, and before there was uh, an expectation potentially of government incentives or programs to stimulate the economy. External financing actually went down, but conversely, energy service agreements like performance contracting, ESCOs, public-private partnerships actually had the biggest one-year increase we've ever seen going from 14 to 21%. And the biggest surprise is that organizations that have set aside money, either capital or operating budget, to make improvements to address energy or climate goals, um, increased by almost a factor of three. That is um, um, a surprising note, and hopefully that will carry forward into the future despite the economic recession, which is looming. Finally, um, wouldn't, be, um, uh, wouldn't be appropriate for this particular uh, webinar if we didn't say something about government policy. I'm not sure why the first bar isn't um, displaying, at least on my screen, but the first bar actually relates to building benchmarking, performance benchmarking and standards. That is um, by far um, um, considered the most important um, at, for driving investment and improvements in energy efficiency in buildings, building energy codes and product performance standards next, um, building owner tenant relationships, and then finally financial incentives and programs. What I'd like to do now, um, by the way, here is a link to a 
four page summary of the energy efficiency indicator in 2019. But now what I would like to do is share with you some of the highlights of the energy efficiency indicator in 2010. It's the same countries, it's still about 1500 organizations. What was it like then? Just to set a little bit of background, um, the, uh, um, the ARA economic stimulus bill was passed in February of 2009. So that was well before the survey, which was taken in March and April of 2010. Um, the, the survey um, was um, actually also taken after COP15 in Copenhagen, when there was great expectation that there would be a global agreement around climate change. So what's very interesting is, is how different the world was back in 2010, coming out of an economic crisis um, in a severe recession called the Great Recession. What's fascinating is that 81% of organizations thought climate legislation was likely within two years. 75% in the US said it was likely, and 97% in China said it was likely. Now this was back after the failure of the COP15 in Copenhagen. Number two is energy prices were significantly rising at the time. 64% thought energy prices would rise in the next year, and the median estimate of how much energy prices would rise, electricity and gas and other fuels, was 9%. Very significant year-on-year -year increases expected in price. 34% um, said that um, um, energy efficiency in buildings was their primary strategy for addressing climate change. 11% said that on-site renewable energy was a key strategy, and only 8% were using green power purchases. PPAs, virtual PPAs, hadn't even been invented yet back then. So energy efficiency in buildings uh, was clearly the driver. And here's the interesting fact. 56% of organizations invested the same or more in the last 12 months. And don't forget, this last 12 months included the depth of the Great Recession. So what will be interesting is will these optimistic predictions of investment in key clean energy technologies persist through the COVID-19? Um, health crisis and the economic recovery to follow? Or um, will we see a lapse? One of the things we plan to do is run the 2010 study early this year in the fall so we can get an update, a six month update, if you will, on what is the current status. So with that, um, we are going to turn it over to our uh, panel. We're going to ask each of them to make brief comments uh, on the survey results and um, also um, um, share with us any thoughts they have about the impact of this research and what we can expect in the days ahead. Jeff Echo will be beginning. He's president, CEO, and chairman of Hannon Armstrong. Uh, a leading investor in climate change solutions. He served in that capacity since 2013, but has been in the industry uh, since 1985, almost as long as I have. Um, Jeff's a member of the Board of Directors of the Alliance to Save Energy. He's a member of the President's Council for Ceres. He's on the Board of Trustees of the Natural Conservancy of Maryland and DC, and is a director of the New York City-based Urban Green Council. Um, Jeff, thank you for joining the panel. This is not the first panel you've been on talking about the energy efficiency indicator. So you've got a bit of advantage. You firsthand, you have commented on these trends for many years. And thank you for joining us. Hey, thank you for having uh, uh, Hannah Armstrong on and, and it's uh, my pleasure to, uh, to be here today. Uh, yes, I'm a, the biggest fan of this survey in all 13 years and uh, uh, having uh, uh, been in the energy efficiency business actually since 81. Um, uh, and uh, it is uh, my first first passion. And, and Hannah Armstrong invests about a billion dollars a year in 
climate change solutions, the uh, vast preponderance of that is in energy efficiency. Uh, dovetailing with the study, um, what we're seeing within our investment uh, the horizon is a blurring of efficiency and renewable energy. And I think the concept in, in the survey is resilience. Um, what has really driven a blurring of the lines between efficiency and uh, on-site generation is the advent of storage. And uh, you know, that's excellent for the um, companies like Johnson Controls. You have much bigger uh, opportunities, more comprehensive retrofits, and you're really solving a much bigger, thornier problem for your clients uh, in that you're providing a really a different quality of energy supply than they, they can get through uh, poles and wires from the utility. So, and I think that's entirely consistent with uh, the survey results. The impact, um, when, when the customer wants to have resiliency, uh, the, the, very, the, the basic fact is that solar or co-generation um, uh, plus storage is more expensive than energy efficiency. And so once uh, clients start to figure that out, they immediately say, how do we reduce the load? How do we um, uh, prioritize the energy efficiency investments first? so that we have to supply a smaller portion of the energy. And, and that's where you get to um, um, much more comprehensive solutions that include energy efficiency. Um, so I, I think the, uh, the survey is just a, a marvelous tool for the industry to uh, uh, consider where we were and where it's going. I think from a uh, COVID-19 experience, our leadership team for the first time in my memory um, is actually talking about our HVAC system uh, and uh, what kind of UV light do we have on it and can we replace it? Um, so, and we'll be doing that. I think that provides a, uh, a much even more comprehensive scope for uh, somebody like Johnson Controls to, to capture. It's not just uh, energy cost reduction and resiliency, it's uh, health of the, uh, the building. And people will absolutely demand that. Uh, they, it's good that they demand green buildings now. People will not show up in a, uh, a virus-filled building that they can't get some assurance that it's safe. So with that, why don't I leave the, uh, the comments there. Congrats on the, uh, uh, the study and thank you for your uh, leadership on the Alliance. Thanks, Jeff. Excellent comments. Um, we'll get back to you with more questions from the audience uh, shortly. Um, our second speaker, also from North America, but the north part of North America, is Joyce Henry, Director General, Office of Energy Efficiency at Natural Resources Canada. She, um, uh, the Office of Energy Efficiency provides policy advice to the Minister of Natural Resources to optimize energy use in Canada, delivers programs, information, guidance, and regulations to support Canadians, businesses, industry, and the transportation sector to effectively reduce energy use. Um, um, we, are, we are really glad that Joyce Henry is on our, our um, steering governance team for the EE Global Alliance and has been very active in that and other alliance activities. So Joyce, tell us a little bit of what's going on north of our border. Thank you very much, Clay, for the introduction. Um, I'm really pleased to participate in today's session uh, and also to see just the progress you've made uh, with respect to moving towards important global initiatives like the 3% Club. You know, that's a, that's a really important piece that we've worked on together and I appreciate also being part of the panel today. So maybe I'll just leap in um, and say that, uh, you know, today I'm in my basement and while I've been lucky enough to <laughs> participate in the past two EE Globals in Copenhagen and BC, a little bit of a different situation uh, this morning. Um, but I do really appreciate the initiative of these webinars that are going to be happening and this one being the first one. I think, you know, it's just so important to be sharing our message about how critical energy efficiency is uh, to promote low carbon energy transition right now. So um, just think always follow closely in Canada and have some um, 
just really interesting results again. And I, I love the retrospective with 2000. I'll briefly talk about Canada's uh, economic stimulus response and where we're at in developing that. Go around. Uh, to sort out. Hey Joyce, what? sorry to interrupt, but at, at least from my side, you're, you're, you're kind of breaking up a little bit. Um, um, could we ask everyone um, who isn't um, speaking, that's listening in, uh, the hundreds of you, to, uh, to uh, mm -hmm. please go on mute and um, um, try not to use your video to, to, to share the precious bandwidth as we uh, try to bring in people from all around the world to the uh, presentation. So Joyce, back to you. Okay, I did get a message that my internet was unstable. Um, so let me know if I break up again. And in the meantime, I think what I'll turn to is uh, just what we've been doing in Canada right now. So, um, you know, primarily, population of our effort additional real priority on economic stability um, and income stability for our citizens and business and industry and so the arc we're following as we move toward so get ready for the recovery and ideas Hey, Joyce. Hey, Joyce, here's what I recommend, if you can hear me. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. I suggest that we come back to you, you reboot your computer, um, and, 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 and log back into the webinar, and I think that will clear the buffer, and we will reserve some, some time for you um, to come back. I'm only hearing about one out of every 10 words, so, I think it's best if we do the the, the uh, typical Zoom reboot and um, um, log back in, and I'm sure everything will be uh, better when you do. Okay. And sorry to interrupt, Clay. Joyce, if you turn your camera off, that might help. It'll pri prioritize the audio instead of the camera. Okay. Perfect. Thank you so much. I'll do that. Okay. Then uh, we'll be back to Joyce because um, um, she gave us a briefing on what she was going to talk about, and it's very important. <laughs> And uh, we uh, definitely want to hear every word. Let's move to He Ping. He's the Industry Program Director at Energy Foundation China. Um, he joined Energy Foundation China in January of 2008. Previously, he worked um, in the United Nations Development Program, six years in Africa, in Europe, and eight years working with the Chinese Academy of Sciences. Um, he's been at this a long time and is one of the most respected global thought leaders in energy efficiency and in the part of the world where a lot of uh, uh, construction development energy efficiency work um, has, has been completed in the past and will in the future. So, He Ping, thank you very much for staying up late at night in Beijing and we look forward to your comments, sir. Uh. Thank you, Clay, for, uh, for the uh, nice uh, uh, introduction. So this has given me a good memory for the, my, uh, my early years, uh, at the younger age. So uh, indeed, very, very uh, pleased to join this webinar. I believe this is a very useful tool for, for people who are working in the energy deficiency field to communicate each other with this uh, special uh, situation. Uh, I also like to uh, congr congr congratulate uh, uh, the ASE and the Johnson Control for launch the energy efficiency indi indicators in uh, 2019. So I believe uh, I also went through all the, uh, the slides and also the information you provided to me. I believe this is very, very informative. So I, so I, I believe uh, you you taking thirty years. So it's not easy uh, work. I mean, for thirty years. So 
maybe uh, this is the, 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 the people who are, we are working in this, this field, we, we have to be the persistent. So I think this is one of the way for us to persistent to working on address climate change issues to uh, improve energy efficiency. So I, I believe uh, this is a really useful survey. I also look at some of the data of the, on the China parts. I, I believe this is uh, very, very uh, um, uh, good. So uh, I, I believe the approach, uh, you have uh, interviews with more than 13 uh, people. I believe uh, this is a, uh, it's not easy, but it's very nice. I think uh, um, all the uh, the previous panelists also talking about the COVID nineteen. So I I also want to provide some uh, some perspective from China uh, parts. I'm sure you know China is China is the first country who has this uh, pandemic. Uh, starting from uh, two months ago, we have been stay at home almost uh, two months and a half. Um, I believe like other countries, uh, China is also de developing a series of a stimulus package to caution the significant blow of this uh, pandemic to, to its already slowing economy because China for the first quarter, the GDP increase is minus 6.8%. So uh, in terms of the uh, stim uh, stimulus uh, plan, the, uh, the central government has not yet uh, implemented a large scale centralized stimulus, stimulus package to respond to the economic uh, crisis. But efforts to date has been sector by sector or pro province by province has launched, uh, announced emergency response measures. For example, the different ministries and the provinces has, have de uh, deployed a cluster of, uh, of the programs to, to improve the people's living standards and bear out the hard hit of the business, and also such as stabilizing the earning of the low-income individuals offering the consumption vouchers and uh, to residents and also promote the tax rebates to small and medium enterprises and, and more. And also government also launched already call for the significant uh, um, investment. So uh, the particularly focus on, on the, on the uh, 5G base station, uh, big data, artificial intelligence, Internet of the industry, uh, also high voltage transmission, and also high speed uh, intercity urban railways and uh, il and uh, EV charging station as well. And also talking about the total size of the uh, investment currently, uh, uh, by date, the twenty five province has already already launched the the the, uh, the investment uh, package roughly uh, close to 46 trillion RMB. So it means uh, for, uh, for 2020, roughly will be 6 point, uh, 6, uh, 7.6 trillion investment for, for, for 2020. So let me just stop here. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much, Hipping. Appreciate that and the, the update. It's interesting to see the, the uh, priority for um, 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 China stimulus being around electrification of vehicles in particular and public transit and that. Um, something that is certainly being talked about significantly in the U.S. and other countries as well. All right, now we will move to um, um, Monica Frassoni. She's president of the European Alliance to Save Energy. She's an Italian politician who was the co-chair of the European Green Party until 2019. She co-founded and is the current president of the European Alliance to Save Energy, a multi-stakeholder business-led organization which aims to promote and advocate energy savings and a new energy model. She's also a member of the steering committee of the Coalition of Energy Savings. So Monica, thank you for calling in later in the um, afternoon or evening uh, from Europe 
And we'd love to hear what's happening there in the area of energy efficiency, as well as the impact on economic recovery plans there. Monica, over to you. Well, um, I don't know if you can see me right. Yes? Yes. Okay, so um, hello everyone and hello from Brussels. We are uh, slightly locked down as uh, I guess most of you. Um, I think that uh, we were pretty lucky in the European Union that uh, the launching of the Green Deal, um, that is to say this idea uh, that uh, economic growth or in, or in any case the economic development of the European Union had to be coherent with the Paris Agreement and with the target of uh, having net zero emissions by, um, by 2050. Uh, I'm not sure that uh, had the COVID-19 crisis began earlier, we would be in, uh, in the same situation, but now we are. And uh, I think that one of the most interesting elements of the consequences of the uh, COVID is certainly to understand how much of this plan, which is a mixture between reallocation of resources, uh, revamping and re, uh, um, uh, reassessing of current uh, regulations and new regulations will be actually uh, implemented. Um, and uh, so this is the first thing to say. The second thing to say is that Energy efficiency is uh, a sort of Cinderella in the European debate, although over the last 10 years, probably also thanks to us, <laughs> um, the, the, and in any case, the community that uh, was set up after 2010, um, the, um, you know, the, the, the point of having energy efficiency at the center is with this concept that we have developed with the energy efficiency first, is something that is, is, is basically a commonplace. But I believe that there are um, a lot of bugs and some to um, make the European Union shows energy efficiency in the three areas, buildings, uh, transport and industry, as a real game changer. So we still have problems. Probably the, the problem we don't have is uh, investment uh, willingness and uh, uh, capacity also of the public um, uh, of the public financial um, bodies to finance actually uh, energy efficiency. But we do have administrative issues. We have problems in member states with implementation of the EU regulation. We have issues in making the right money going to the right place. So all sorts of, of questions that are still there and it probably will become more complicated with COVID-19 because now everybody, the situation in some areas are completely awful. I myself come originally from one of the worst hit cities uh, in Italy called Brescia, uh, which is a very industrial place. And uh, now the, the real, um, the real uh, priority is of course to get over the sanitary bit, but also to get people back to work. And this is of course a risk in the European debate. Great. Thank you, Monica. Really appreciate the comments. And um, we'll be uh, answering questions from the audience soon. Uh, Joyce, um, I see your name. Have, have you been able to rejoin us? I have. I've rejoined us and I've rejoined by my phone, actually, which I think might be more stable than my computer connection. So hopefully you can hear me okay. You are coming through perfectly clear. I would ask you to start from the beginning of your remarks and we look forward to them. Okay, great. Okay, well, thank you very much. Um, I'm really pleased to be part of this panel today. Um, it's a little bit different than other panels I've been on in you know, the last two e-globals in Washington and Copenhagen, because I'm in my basement like so many others of us, <laughs> so slightly different vibe. Um, but I am really pleased that we're able to do this. And I, I think the fact that, uh, that Clay, you were able to link your results from 2019 back to what we saw in 2009 and 2010 coming out of what was a really significant economic downturn, um, you know, really sets us up uh, both for the discussion today as, you know, all of our countries continue to find their way through, uh, you know, what is a really terrible global pandemic and the expected economic um, 
downturn that we're, we're going to see from it. So from Canada's perspective, and I'm, I'm going to obviously give our government perspective um, and speak from that uh, place because I'm a public servant in the government of Canada. Um, so first and foremost, we're focused on public health and, and that's where, uh, you know, the majority of our efforts have been. Um, in addition to that, uh, obviously a major priority is ensuring economic stability and income stability for our citizens and business and industry. Um, you know, and as we follow this kind of arc in three phases with public health and income stability first, we're doing a lot of policy work around what recovery and stimulus phases will look like. And there's been a really significant uh, and, and quite purposeful uh, link between uh, these first two phases of public health and income stability and where we'll go next on recovery, recovery and stimulus. And, and you know, maybe within that context, the, one of the really important things uh, that we're trying to achieve is to can keep workers connected to their businesses and companies. And a lot of what the government has announced so far um, has looked to do that. And, and you know, that, that's because we want to be able to have a rapid recovery. Uh, and, I, you know, I think it is safe to say that, you know, with respect to uh, recovery and what we look towards for stimulus, we're really focusing on job creation and measures that will keep us on our path to achieving the government's agenda of net zero by 2050. Um, Monica mentioned the Green Deal in Europe. Um, you know, currently our plan to 2030 to meet our Paris commitments is called the Pan-Canadian Framework um, on Climate Change. Uh, and, um, and, you know, that's, that's still our roadmap forward, uh, but we're also working towards this other policy objective of net zero by 2050. And, and that will inform you know, a lot of the stimulus uh, ideas that are coming forward. Um, so we are looking at this point, you know, in a, in, a, in a major way at some really new ideas, but also evaluating where we can build on existing programs and initiatives. And, you know, a really important piece of that is trying to figure out what a post-COVID world is going to look like, which, you know, obviously is not easy uh, for any of us. Um, but really, you know, that's focused partly on what's our labor force, what, you know, what situation they'll be in, what will still be needed for physical distancing, you know, assuming, uh, you know, next waves of a pandemic, um, and also, you know, what supply chains will look like. I mean, Canada is really a trading nation. We export and import a lot. Uh, and so supply chains globally, you know, that's a big, uh, a big area of focus as we consider stimulus measures uh, and it, it informs our work. Um, the other thing I would just note is from a government of Canada perspective, you know, we work really closely with our provinces and territories, municipal governments, indigenous communities, stakeholders, you know, private sector, non-governmental organizations. We're, we're a federal state and, and energy and energy efficiency is a jurisdiction that we share. Uh, so we always work closely with our provinces and territories, but I guess one of the maybe silver linings, uh, one of the few silver linings we're seeing from the pandemic is that, you know, the level of cooperation across jurisdictions and national purpose, you know, has really just come that much more to the fore. So, you know, we're, we're really working closely with our partners and that includes obviously on energy efficiency. So, you know, we don't think that the government has all the good ideas. We think we have many, but not all. Um, and so we're really actively developing solutions with, uh, with domestic and international thought leaders and our stakeholders and, and learning from forums like this. Uh, and just really, you know, there's a, there's a huge amount of analysis and work and dialogue going on uh, across all parts of society. And, you know, we're very mindful and I think it's coming to the fore in the discussions we're having that the climate action is really critical in the near term and energy efficiency, um, you know, much like the Green Deal in Europe, you know, it's really well placed as we consider stimulus. Um, in fact, on uh, last Friday, our minister actually took part in a, in a meeting focused on the role of energy efficiency and renewables in mm -hmm. stimulus plans that were co-hosted by Denmark and the International Energy Agency. Um, you know, so that's, that speaks to, um, you know, how engaged, uh, you know, the, the government is with respect to energy efficiency actions. Uh, you know, we know that, uh, energy efficiency supports the goals of economic stimulus by leveraging our existing workforce. It creates jobs and you know, creates skilled jobs in communities right across the country. Uh, we saw that um, in in uh, in the 2009 downturn as well, and we're hearing that from stakeholders. 
Um, certainly with respect to the, you know, to buildings and homes, that's an area that's getting a lot of interest. And we have evidence that supports that public sector programs focusing on home retrofits and building retrofits have been really you know, significant in, in terms of the economic benefits they generate, um, as well as the other additional benefits, which we've talked about and heard about here from Jeff in terms of greater comfort and productivity. Um, so we already have a number of programs uh, across the country that address retrofits and weatherization in, in different capacities. And you know, I think we're, we're certainly in discussions with stakeholders and, and, uh, and other governments on, on what that looks like and whether there's more to be done there. Uh, we're also looking at clean fuels, um, including how to maintain our leadership in hydrogen and fuel cell technology in Canada, and looking at past successful programs to increase our biofuel production. Uh, and we have current programs, obviously, on electric vehicle and infrastructure programs. Um, I guess I'll just finish by saying that, you know, there's a number of key questions that we're, we're considering in all of this. You know, how do we harness our clean energy strategies to reduce emissions and also drive success in the built environment and other sectors? Is our workforce ready to deliver energy efficiency stimulus measures? And what will they need to be equipped as we move forward in a post-pandemic environment? Um, what's the new new normal you know and how does that influence what future we want and you know i think we have a really strong foundation to build on but as you can imagine coordinating and leading a response in a country as large and regionally di diverse as canada is a big challenge so we're trying to do this with with thought and speed um but we are taking a, a quite an iterative approach based on the evidence as it comes in and and this is a, an approach i think we'll see on on stimulus as well so Really welcome to hear about how stimulus can look in, uh, you know, for, for as we continue our debate. I was going to say in other jurisdictions, but actually, I guess we've already, now that I'm the last speaker, that doesn't really fit anymore, does it? <laughs> Back to you, Clay. Thank you. Thank you, Joyce, for great timely um, um, comments. It seems like there's a, a great deal of commonality between the regions about the importance of energy efficiency and other clean energy technologies being a priority for for the uh, um, um, uh, stimulus activities forward. Monica, I'd like to um, um, follow up with you. Joyce talked about the fact that, 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 that Canada is made up of provinces, um, some of which are great leaders in things like um, net zero carbon buildings and energy efficiency, but it's a very di diverse country. Um, I think you see the same thing within the European Union. Could you talk a little bit about uh, two things? One is the uh, Renovate Wave, one of my favorite programs going on anywhere in the country, and talk about the differences from country to country. Where do you see energy efficiency being a more critical component of the member states' plans around recovery, and, 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 and where is there more, more work to do? Monica, over to you. Well, I think that uh, basically there is work to do everywhere. And, uh, and I think that, uh, that uh, this is a very important element to be, to be taken into account. Um, so there is a general framework, which is the European Union one. The fact that uh, um, we uh, have all to reach some goals which, uh, we are, that are commonly defined. Uh, but these goals, as far as energy efficiency are concerned, are really... Uh, not very ambitious. And, uh, and I think that that has been over the last years a big issue because uh, they, the, the common ones are binding targets, are not binding targets. Um, but I think that there is a general recognition that people have to basically adopt them. So in terms of, uh, there, is, there are a lot of uh, dif differences in, uh, in, in the way in which different member states uh, uh, take on uh, energy efficiency. And also you have to take into account that uh, a lot of countries like Italy, Germany, Austria, et cetera, are federal countries, which makes the things mm -hmm. even more complicated. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, but let's say that in general, the, there are some schemes uh, that are relatively successful, and I will certainly mention uh, uh, the, uh, the tax breaks that we have in, uh, in Italy um, that uh, allows to uh, renovate uh, under an energy efficiency point of view uh, the, uh, your house uh, and you get a sort of bonus uh, to do that. And this has been relatively effective, although um, the energy efficiency aspect is, uh, is, is only a part of it. Then you have other schemes which are somehow less satisfactory, which is basically I give you money. So I have a fund and uh, I give you some money in order to do it. 
uh, and the companies are free to take them or not, and local authorities are basically free to do it or not. This is a case of Spain. Uh, they were not very happy about that, and they were on to change it. Then there are some other, uh, other countries like Germany or Eastern Europe, which uh, are also having some kind of interest, uh, interesting uh, schemes, like uh, um, one of the Eastern European countries, I can't remember if it is Poland or, or Czech Republic, but uh, uh, they uh, basically devote the ETS money, so the money that is taken from the emission trading system to energy efficiency. This is also a good idea. But in general, what uh, we have to take into account is that if you don't have a European legislation that is giving you some kind of guideline, it is very difficult to do much. And uh, this is, uh, for example, uh, we have a directive which is uh, uh, basically obliging member states to go towards net zero um, or almost uh, um, uh, zero emission buildings within a certain deadline. And, uh, the, and this is applying uh, above all for new buildings, but then there has been a new one, which uh, also refers to old buildings. So if you want, it's, uh, it's all a fight between having a good legislation at European level money that can easily reach those who deserve it basically uh, and uh, also um, the participation of the financial uh, the financial sector which uh, has been more and more uh, offering um, in the, this the so-called green loans or green bonds or green um, uh, mortgage but uh, here uh, for example one of the biggest difficulty and this is the same thing all over europe is a lack of demand, the lack of projects that, uh, that can be actually presented. So in a nutshell, we have an issue of having a, a good and effective legislation, which we are more or less getting there, uh, an insufficient and non-binding target, which uh, uh, has been a problem, and, uh, uh, but on the other hand, uh, readiness to invest um, a much more, uh, a much larger uh, financial um, uh, availability, both from the private and the public, above all European level sector, and a, and a, and a motivation to actually uh, respect the targets of Paris. Great, thank you. That was an excellent, excellent response. We have a couple questions in from the audience, and one question um, relates to uh, jobs, and it was directed to Joyce, and I think that's underlying all of this discussion about economic recovery. Yes, energy efficiency um, um, reduces the costs of small businesses and other organizations, puts an awful lot of construction workers. Um, I know, at least in the U.S., many utility programs have been halted. They don't want auditors and construction people going through homes and buildings. It's had a tremendously negative impact on the energy efficiency industry as a whole with respect to jobs that support it. Um, Joyce, um, this must be front and center in what you're dealing with in Canada. W would you care to answer that? Sure, thank you. I was actually busy typing an answer back to uh, somebody else and I, I apologize to that person uh, if, if we don't get to your question because I, <laughs> I was typing and I couldn't figure out how to keep part of my answer. So I'll start over when I'm done answering this one. But um, <laughs> yeah, with respect to this one, I mean, certainly we, we've actually spent a lot of time uh, since the, you know, the self-isolation uh, um, provisions have come into, um, have come to fruition, if I can put it away, or come, uh, come into force across uh, Canada in reaching out to our, our different uh, parts of the energy efficiency sector and in, in talking to businesses and business associations about how they're finding uh, the pandemic and the impact on them. Uh, in Canada, it's interesting because, uh, you know, local affairs are under our provincial government's mandates. And so what we've seen is we've seen a diversity of approaches across the country uh, in different provinces in terms of what's been deemed essential services uh, because different provinces and different regions have, you know, a different um, density or a different density in terms of COVID cases and recovery and death rates. And so uh, I would say the, the overall effect is uh, obviously not great on uh, energy efficiency businesses. Uh, it does depend a little bit on what region of the country you're in. Um, but 
what the government has done uh, at the federal level to try to assist in this. And I think I mentioned earlier that we're working closely with the provinces and territories um, on all aspects of the pandemic response is they put in place a number of different uh, income support programs, both for small and medium sized business, as well as larger uh, businesses and direct income support for Canadians. Uh, so we have a, a pretty strong social safety net in Canada. We have employment insurance uh, already, but um, we've also announced in addition to that direct income programs um, for people so that they can remain at work and businesses don't have to lay them off, uh, even if they can't work right now. Uh, so obviously not maybe quite as much as they would make if they were on the job, but sufficient to uh, maintain hopefully uh, their, um, their livelihood for now. Uh, we've also most recently introduced a program for students um, that still needs to be approved by our parliament, um, but that's happening uh, in the coming days. So we've really focused a lot on income support uh, because energy efficiency businesses like others are hard hit. Uh, and I guess what I, the other piece I would say is that we've really been, we've had a lot of discussions around, you know, are there, other things that would be useful for us to support businesses in or to support our provinces and territories in doing with our energy efficiency sector businesses. Uh, so that can include, you know, information, but one of the things that we've been really focused on, which I think is quite promising, um, is can there be some e-learning like what you know we have a lot of associations and businesses across the countries that engage in training and certification around energy efficiency and this is a really great time at the shoulder season anyway uh, to get you know them, that stuff done virtually and so we're really focused on doing that with uh, some of our stakeholders right now great okay thank you very much um we've got just a couple minutes left before i forget um Please join us for the rest of this series of webinars. We have uh, exciting webinars coming up. One is going to focus specifically on reviewing the energy efficiency programs from the um, uh, economic recovery in 2009 with speakers from both the US and Europe sharing their different perspectives on the recovery. We have other workshops or webinars coming up, one about the 3% Club Thank you, uh, Joyce, for the shout out on the 3% Club, a coalition of institutions, business, and um, a growing number of countries that have committed to make a 3% annual improvement in energy efficiency over time. To close it out, I'd like to ask each of the panelists um, to um, share with us one last word of advice they would give to governments um, to ensure that energy efficiency is top of mind in any economic stimulus program. And I'd like you to restrict your answer to a tweet, 130 characters. Um, Jeff, I know you're up to that, so uh, why don't you uh, start us off? Carbon tax and dividend. Put a tax on carbon, it's never been cheaper, and dividend the proceeds back out to uh, uh, individuals they've never needed it more perfect hip in uh yes i i believe uh, everyone should uh, should get get less land from 10 years st stimulus plan so that plan has uh, created a lot of uh, uh, um um uh, I would see uh, problems, so we have to learn. That we have should have a lessons learned from that time. Great, thank you very much, Monica. Well, energy efficiency is both the solution to the climate crisis as also to the pandemic. This one and the next one. That's great. And finally, Joyce, last word to you. Well, thank you. Monica kind of stole my answer. I'm fully on board with the energy efficiency club. <laughs> Sorry. And renewables as the job creator, economic stimulus, and yes, climate action all wrapped into one beautiful package. All right. I hope we have many government stakeholders uh, and other groups that can share in our advocacy for energy efficiency being front and center in any economic stimulus package, improving health, increasing resilience, making facilities more efficient, and being able to flexibly um, um, change their operation in response to natural health and other emergencies. So 
thank you all um, for participating in the webinar. We look forward to seeing you in future webinars and a special thanks to our expert global panel for sharing their thoughts, experience, and advice. Thank Have you. Have a great, Ciao. safe, and healthy day, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye.